But what I want to talk to you about has to do with friendship. We're going to focus on this. And, and what I'm going to ask you to do is give me just, just a moment to hear my heart. And we're going to ask the Lord to reveal something. This is not just about how to get friends and keep them. <laughs> how, how to win friends in my life or, 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 or just how can I be a friend. But we're going to go take a look at biblical principles that talk about friendships, relationships, dealing with that on the level spiritually. The Bible has a lot to say about friendships. Did you know that? A lot of them. First one that jumps up to me is Jonathan and David. They had a great friendship. Uh, you find in the Word of God. Uh, we're going to look in a few different places. You'll see we're going to look in Mark chapter 2 in just a moment. Then I'm going to refer over to Daniel. <clears throat> we're going to take a look at a couple um, areas of Scripture. And here's what I want to ask you to do. When we talk about friendships, one of the first things that happens is we start saying things like, yeah, yeah, our kids of this generation, they need to hear this stuff. And that's true, they do. But what I want to pose to you is us adults need to hear this stuff as well, if not more. Because we've gotten complacent. We've gotten to a place where we've said um, to our kids, we're telling them, do as I say, not as I do. And you're not teaching them a good lesson. And, And then those kids grow up and they get hurt because they don't want to become vulnerable so they don't have close relationships. Or they they tried to make relationships but in the wrong way and got hurt. So then they grow up just saying, forget it all. And they start telling their kids, here's what you need to do. So do do what I'm telling you. Don't do what I did. And we repeat that vicious cycle. So I want to talk to you today about friendships. Well, why should we talk about that? Well, I don't know about you, but it's good to have a few friends in our life. If you're here today and your spouse is your best friend, I'm not discouraging that. I can look at my wife and say, hey, my wife's my best friend, but I also need a male best friend in my life. I'll tell you what I do not need. I do not need another female best friend. (laughs) All right? So when we talk about friendships here today, we're talking about men. You need some men in your life. Women, you need some women in your life. And if woman, you've got a man in your life that's not supposed to be there, get him out. Man, if you've got a woman in your life that's not supposed to be there, get her out. doesn't mean you have to be rude. doesn't mean you have to be all, you know, like, you know, oh, mm mm-mm. You know, you don't have to pull all that stuff, all right, you know, get thee behind me, you know, you don't need to be spiritual, you just need to say, maybe we need some better boundaries here, and, um, and you've got to do that, if you need to know why and where it's at in the Bible, I'll tell you later, but we'll continue with this trail, friendships, we need these relationships, I, I have a good friend who's a, a guy, you met him a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave, remember him, he's, he's one of my, one of my best friends, and And I I have a few friends, but, you know, I don't need a whole lot of friends uh, that are real close, but I do need a few. And the problem we have today is is we've got, especially with the men, men, I'm going to pick on you today simply because I is one of them, and uh, I don't want to pick on the girls and have them waiting for me outside the church. So, (laughs) I'm no dummy. Um, Men today. Uh, the largest percentage is the adult, white, heterosexual man who has no close friend. Uh, Statistics, studies, you know, that's all they are, statistics and studies, but they're fairly accurate. The adult, white, heterosexual male has the fewest friends of any other uh, gender and kind of socio, whatever you want to do there. Uh, that's, That's who, and why is that? Well, there's all other studies on that. But it boils down to um, when they were younger, typically, and young and impressionable and vulnerable, what happens is, is we say, real men don't cry. Quit crying, you sissy. You know, we say things like that. You know, once you grow up, get some tough skin. And, and what we do is, is it, it harms that, that, that emotional, relational growth that needs to take place. And, and guys can call guys names that are pretty harsh and, but, but it's something one guy could call another guy, and the guy would be okay with it. But still, it's not appropriate, and it, and it does something here in your spirit. And, and, and it brings a demoralizing and devaluing that takes place inside to where when you grow up, eventually, there's no real ro- close relationships. Because any time I was vulnerable, and any time I was open back here, I got called a sissy, or a wuss, or a, and it gets worse, okay? And you, you, you fill those names in. And... You know, sometimes I, I talk to people about this and guys will be like, oh, pfft, oh, come on, these kids just need to grow up. That's the reason they're having these problems is because of that attitude. And um, it's true they do need to grow up. But it's also true that that person that has that mindset needs to grow up too. 
It's all of us. We need to grow in this. So what happens is, is we grow and not have many close friendships. I was blessed to have Pastor Dave in my life, uh, uh, to have him in my life as my friend. He's the one that I can put my size uh, 10 foot in my mouth, way deep in there, pop it out, and he's still going to love me right where I'm at. I can tell him that I think he's an idiot, I think you're stupid for the choices you're making, and I don't think that was God. And then five days later, I can go, maybe I was wrong, go back to him, and he's going to be all right because he knows I really love him, even if I disagree at times. He knows I'm not perfect, I know I'm not perfect, and um, we just have a good relationship. I can can hang out with him, not see him for 10 months, and when I do see him, it's like I just saw him yesterday. That's a healthy relationship, but most of us don't have, especially men, don't have those relationships, And, and a lot of times men say, well, you know, you got lucky. It wasn't luck, it was work. It was work. It was an investment. I didn't just wake up one day and say... I think you'll be my best friend. I had to invest in that friendship. I had to invest in that relationship. And I want to encourage you, and I'm going to challenge all of you at the end of this service to do something about establishing, just kind of start making some connections. I'm not saying we all have to walk out of here holding hands, singing kumbaya, okay? (laughs) But what can we do to start developing some of these relationships? Ladies, you need to do that too. But like I said, I'm picking on the guys today because I is one. So I want to talk to you about friendship. Um, and letting ourselves become a little bit more vulnerable. If we don't have these close friendships, we tend to feel alone. We t- uh, t- tend to feel like we're just, it, it, we're vacant. And, and, um, and, then, and then it feels like the world's just completely against us. And we need those relationships. You know, today, with today's craze of social media, we've added new words to our dictionary, and one of the words that we've added to the dictionary is the word unfriend. Did you know that? It's in the stinking dictionary. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Unfriend. So here, I looked it up. Webster defines unfriend as this, to move someone from a list or designate, uh, uh, try that again, to remove someone from a list of designated friends on a person's social networking website. Unfriend. It's, the, it's defined. Hey, I, I was typing this message up, and you know how when you're typing in Word or whatever program you're using, if you type something wrong, it's going to let you know it. You know, hey, you spelled that word wrong, squiggle, 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 underlined in red, and it hollers at you. I typed the word unfriend, and it went, yeah, that's a word, no problem. Even the software we use identifies the word unfriend as a, a, an acceptable word to be defined. See, maybe you're here today, and have you ever friended somebody, unfriended somebody? Have you ever, maybe you've, maybe you've disliked something on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, maybe, maybe you're like, Pastor, I'm not into the social stuff. Well, have you ever had a magazine subscription that you've unsubscribed from? Uh, today, they use the thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, this really rocks my world here. I'm just, I got to get this off my chest, Okay. I updated my phone to, I've, I have an iPhone 6S or something like that, and uh, I suppose I can stop holding my thumbs like that, can't I? Um, I updated the, the, the program, and now when you type a message in the text message, I typed something like, you know, hey Seth, have a great day, and don't forget to text me later on your phone. And when I was getting ready to send it, all of a sudden, like three or four words highlighted. I was like, so I asked my kids, I'm like, what is this about? And they said, oh, well, those words highlight in case you want. If you push them, it'll get rid of the word and put an emoji there. And I said, are you serious? <laughs> Have we gotten so te- technologically smart that we're actually going back to the cave? I mean, we... we... <laughs> we're coming back, Dad. <laughs> uh, So I I, I took that message and retyped it. Have a great day, and uh, don't forget I'll text you on the phone, and when you get home, let the dogs out or something like that. And so it it wanted me to go, um, have a great day. Get word of the word great and go, have a day. And don't forget to call me on, and it showed a picture of the cell phone. And when you get home, you can let the, and it had a picture of a dog. I'm like, are you serious? Are we getting so lazy that we can't even type out a text message, let alone read them and respond to them? That has nothing to do with my message, by the way. So I'm going to get right back over here. 
I typed this out, and, and why was I telling you that? Why was I telling you that? Friends and unfriends. Uh, technology has gotten crazy. If you've ever friended or unfriended, thumbs up, thumbs down, or, or any of those, you're today's hero of what we're going to talk about. And what I want to talk to you about is to friend or not to friend. And I want to get beyond the superficial, do we need friends in our life or don't we? Or uh, how can I be a loving, compassionate friend? That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about just the necessity. And what I want to share with you is just a few points that say what we need to remember when establishing these friendships. Because here's what happens. Either we do not get anybody in our life around us that we can really be us. And, and, and I, I can tell you all the, the stupid stuff I do and, and how real I am. And you're still going to love me at the end of it and help me get back on my feet. And I'm going to do the same for you. See, we need to learn to do that, or we need to, to, to quit worrying about having 500 friends so we can feel socially accepted, but none of them are very deep relationships at all. We're just doing that to get attention and to just be, be accepted, and can't we all just kind of get along and partay and have a good time? Yeah, you can do that, but that's not the definition of what a friendship is all about. So when you're going through in life, we have to make sure we understand what this is all, uh, what, what's going on. on. On the top of your outlines, I put this just a kind of a statement that I was writing to myself. I think that sometimes we friend those we should have unfriended and we unfriend some of those that maybe we should have friended in life. It's easy to do on social media. How many of you have found people to be pretty stinking bold on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, snap this or snap that you got, okay? People can be like, you know, well, I think you should do this. Mm, we got all attitude behind it. But we would never say that in front of, them face to face. We say, yeah, well, you can go there. You tell them how to get there, you know, where to go and how to get there. But if you're standing face to face, you wouldn't. We got this boldness about us because we feel like we're, we're bigger and badder and stronger than we really are. And all of a sudden, we determine whether we're going to have friendships with these people based on what they said or we think they said because after all, all we did was read some text. We didn't hear their heart. And so we're determining our relationships by what we perceive that they said or how they said it. Um, we're using that to hide behind, like, a, like, like, like it's, our, it's the bully, it's the one we can hide behind, social media. Or not, and I'm not here preaching against that. I love it. I think it's great. It, it, it excels us in other things too. My point is, is you can't establish good friends by just giving them a thumbs up. That, that did nothing. You have to have some one-on-one -on -one time to build relationship. Proverbs 13, 20, it's in your outlines, it's up on the screen. Let's read this one together, actually. You ready? Go. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companions of fools will be destroyed. If you hang with eagles, you become an eagle. You hang with turkeys, you become? You want to be an eagle or a turkey? Some of us are like, ooh, I like, I like turkeys. Yeah, but turkeys get eaten, Okay. Eagles soar. They go to new heights, and they've got a strength within them. Uh, I won't go there, but th th there's a whole teaching on that about the eagles. It, you walk with wise people, you're going to become wise. You hang around foolish people, you're going to become foolish. If you spend time with people who have integrity, a positive attitude, they inspire you, they encourage you, they challenge you to be all that God wants you to be, sooner or later, those characteristics will become a part of you. Through absorption, because you're hanging around with them. You hang around wise people, the Word of God says, you become wise. You become wise. But if you spend time with grumblers, if you spend time with gossipers, people who think that life is mediocre, it's just a game to be played, they're unhappy, they hold grudges, they don't know how to forgive, and they, and they compromise all the time, then it won't be long through absorption, once again, that you're going to become the exact same person is the one that you're hanging around. So, the characteristics of those with whom you associate, whether bad or good, will eventually become a part of who you are. Well, Pastor, I'm 54, 62, 73. Does that really apply? <laughs> yeah. Are you breathing? Then it applies. Because you're, you, well, I don't have many friends. Don't let that stop you. Don't let age be a factor. Don't let your, your marital status, widowed, widower, a divorce, separate, single, married. You work on relationships and getting people in your life. Don't let those things hold you back, but look at who you're hanging around with because 
Here's how you can know how you're doing. You want to know what you're going to be like in a couple years? Look at the people you're hanging around with. They may be sitting next to you, so maybe don't look now, but... You really want to know what you're going to look like in a year, two years? Look at the people that you're hanging around with. Are they shallow? Watch out. Shallow's on the way. Are they religious and all just nitpicky and always sarcastic? Guess what? It's on the way. Are they positive? Do they help others in need? It's on the way. You become like that with which you hang out with. And I want you to know, that maybe there, there's a process of pruning that needs to take place. Nobody likes to hear that. But I'm just saying it because it's true. Sometimes we have to consider maybe pruning in certain areas of our life. Let me read to you the book of Mark chapter 2 about a story about a man who had four friends. And these are the kind of friends that you want to build. It's kind of a crazy story if you've never heard it before. But um, it's about the paralyzed man. Some of you have heard this before. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm going to read through about verse 12. It says, when he, when he had come back to Capernaum, he, that's Jesus, several days afterwards, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even at the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Say that with me. He was speaking the word. He wasn't just sitting down saying, let's watch some Netflix he didn't say, let's get out the Xbox. He was speaking the word of God. And if Jesus needs to speak the word, use the word, speak the word, how much more do we need to be in the word? He was speaking the word of God. Verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was laying. And Jesus seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Well, why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, it says, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up his pallet, went on his, uh, away in the sight of everyone, so that all were amazed and glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now that's an amazing miracle that just took place. What I want to talk to you about has to do with the beginning of this story. But, but let's not lose sight of the fact that Jesus just performed a miracle here. And, and it says here that Jesus seeing their faith. Who, whose faith did he see? It wasn't the paralyzed man. He's talking about the four men that just jacked open somebody's roof and dropped a man down it. Think about this. How many of you are homeowners here? Uh, how many of you have a roof over your head? Let's just put it that way. You're sitting at home today and you're watching uh, Church of the Open Door on YouTube because you do that all day long, I know. And while you're watching it, wa watching it, while you're watching it, all of a sudden you hear somebody just jackhammering away on the roof of your house. People walking around. What's going on? Shingles start flying. The roof, you see a saw zzz, coming through the roof. You're wondering, what in the heck's going on? You're not going to sit there and say, huh, I think Jesus is in town again. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the norm. You're going to want to go outside and say, hey, Jack, get off my, get off my roof. What are you doing? 911. You're going to be calling the police. You're going to be calling the insurance company. You're, there's gonna, it's not going to look pretty. Here somebody's ripping off the roof of a home because they have a friend and they know that he needs to be in the presence of Jesus so much so that there's not going to be anything that will hold him back. Might I suggest to you and to me today, we need some of those people in our life. Friends that no matter what it takes, they're going to get us to the feet of Jesus, even if they have to wreck your home a little. Even if they have to tell you the truth that you are a little arrogant and cocky and, and you are sarcastic and stubborn and yet you always got to have your way. But I'm telling you that because you need to see this. You need Jesus. You need, there's nothing else that can do. And I'm not talking about people that, you know, we can do that for other people. You, know, you need Jesus, you know. You're just annoying. No, that, that's not a friendship there, okay? That's called criticism. We're all good at that. We need people that can, that can come and just have that one-to-one -one time and say, you give me room to speak into your life, I will. 
once that's been given, then, then they can speak it. But you've got to earn that. How do you do that? Through friendships. Giving people permission and clearance to do that. Um, I want to share with you just, I think it's three things there. Things that we need to remember when establishing these friendships. Because here's, here's the thing. When you leave here today, we are to establish relationships. I, I've already stated the fact that it is the adult, male, white, heterosexual uh, category that has the least amount of friends. It doesn't mean that anyone that doesn't fit that category, they're all good now, okay? We all have to work on these relationships, but if you just think, I, I don't need any friends, I'm just going to try to avoid this whole thing and dodge this bullet, you're just always going to be alone, lonely, defeated, feeling like the world's stacked against you. You need these people in your life that are willing to speak truth. But what do, what do we have to remember? Number one, write this down. Remember, when building the relationships, don't live below your potential. Okay? This is where we got to start. Do not live below your potential. I don't care if your dad and your mom, while you're growing up, called you a loser, a hoser, you'll never make it, you're not going to mount anything, you know, you're just a drama queen, no one's ever going to love you. The, those are not good words to speak, first of all, and there's some work that may have to be done in our hearts to, to get through that and, and to forgive and to be forgiven, but don't let that limit your potential. Don't aim low just because you want to hit something. You know, well, I don't want to disappoint, so, so I'm going to aim way down here because I know I can hit that. I don't know if I can hit that. No, raise your sights. Aim high. If, if you miss, at least you're going to get another shot, all right? And that's what we're afraid of. I'm not going to get another shot. And it's usually when it's a boy or a girl. Good grief. We've we, we got we to gotta aim higher than that, okay? I mean, boys are great, right? Ladies, you like? Yeah. Okay, maybe not. Hey. <laughs> Tough crowd here today. Girls are great. Relationships are fun. And it, and it can be great. It can also be difficult. But what makes it difficult is our unwillingness to learn about relationships. Uh, we're not just adding on another piece of luggage to our life. We're derailing the train. <laughs> That's why he says the two become one. He didn't say, let's bring Jim, let's bring Lisa, and let's just let them duke it out and see who wins. Whoever wins, which that would be me, um, <laughs> You notice I'm not looking over there. <laughs> I'm just giving her a hard time. You just don't let them duke it out and whoever has got the loudest voice or is the most violent or the most angry. Because if that were the truth, that would have been, that would have been me. And uh, what you do is you learn, to, uh, you learn to give and take in a relationship. You learn to let God be the foundation of your relationship. That's what we're ta talking about here. How do you take this word of God, this thing, and kind of extract, get the truth out of it, apply it to our life? When you're building relationships, don't live below your potential, the Bible says. I, I, I serve as the um, chaplain for the sheriff's office here in town. And when I get an opportunity to go visit somebody in jail, um, I, I usually ask them, how did you end up here? Uh, Number one, I want to know. It's a pretty interesting question. You know, it's not like, you know, hey, I saw you Jules today. What were you doing there? It's how did you end up in jail? You know, there's a reason you're here. Um, and I always get about the same response, and it usually sounds like this. Well, it all started when I started hanging around this wrong crowd. Every time. Every, every time. They aimed low in their potential. In Mark 2, Jesus is teaching to a packed house. Four men show up bringing a paralytic friend to Jesus, but they can't get in because of the crowd. So they strap him to a gurney, hoist him up the roof, cut a hole in the roof, drop the man down. Now, I'm trying to put myself in the position of the man on the gurney. I must really trust these guys. Number one, what am I going to do about it anyway? I'm paralyzed. I can't move. These guys are duct taping me to a bed, yanking me up on a roof and saying, you need Jesus. I guess I'm going to see Jesus. But there had to be a friend. I mean, what would possess four men to do that? A friendship, a relationship, something that goes beyond just, hey, let's go, let's go grab a drink together or let's, let's just go bowling or something. I'm talking about being vulnerable with another person. You know, statistics show that men, this is some little bit weird maybe for some, but men want in a friendship the same level of intimacy that they want that as, as women want in a friendship. A lot of times when you use the word 
women and intimacy, the male mind gets scrambled. <laughs> Sex, that's all we heard. But that's, that's not why God created sex. That's to be a, a celebration of an intimate relationship that's taking place. That's why if you're sexually involved with no intimate relationship, it's, it's boring or it's, you know what I mean, it's not deep. It's, that's why you jump from one relationship to the next because there's no intimacy. But statistics show that when women build relationship with other women, they do so because they want an intimate level that the, the husband or the male can't quite give and they connect on this level, but it's about being close and being heard and talking. And that statistics show guys want the same thing. We just go about it differently. They may have to go shoe shopping and talk about 5,000 things and we can just look at each other and grunt, uh, you know, and we're done. We have connected on a level. I'm being serious. <laughs> I know some guys can be difficult, and I know there's some guys that can be drama kings, and I know some guys can, you know, I get that. I don't make friends with them. And, and uh, everyone needs a friend, though. Everyone needs to work on these relationships. But you have to start somewhere, and I want to say this. Don't start living below your potential. Don't aim low. Aim high. I, I've been open with you guys from the very start of ministry. I'm not perfect. I mean, that may have been confusing to some. I woke up in the morning. You know, I grew up in a good home. I woke up in the morning singing worship songs and doing all the chores around the house, right, Dad? And I was doing everything right and never made any wrong choices. Yeah. Yeah. I made mistakes, but one of the things I learned is, is that I was living below the potential that God had for me, and I couldn't see it. You see, when you're, when you're, when you're focused, I, I had friends that I was like, it, it, we're, we're like this, and we'll always be like this, and the truth was, as soon as some pressure came on, they were gone. I could not find them, still have not found them, quite honestly, don't want to find them right now, but the point is, is I was living below my potential. At the moment, all I could see is what I could see. And no, this is it. This is life. These are my friends. This is where it's at. And I, I was aiming so low, and the Lord had to kind of come along and say, Jim, lift your head up, and look what I have for you. God, I can never reach that. And he said, as long as you keep talking like that, you never will. So let me change your vocabulary while I'm at it. All of a sudden, he started to change things in my heart and in my life. You see, we have to be very careful. Uh, we need good friends in our lives, people. And, and by the way, I am, I am, I am not against kids being saying, oh, my mom's my best friend, you know, okay, great, I'm glad that she is, but uh, your mom needs to be your parent, not your best friend. Your dad needs to be your parent, not your best friend. I love my son, I love my daughter, but they're not my bestie, okay? They're not my BFF or whatever other junk you want to throw in there. I, I get so behind on the acronyms. Uh, somebody texted me the other day and put in some initials, I don't know, L-O-H or H-O-L or something like that, and I'm like, I don't get what this is, so I just ignored it. I'll tell you this, we need to make sure that we have good relationships, friendships, and when it comes to the home and to the family, you can have good relationship from father to son and daughter to, to, to mother, but, but we need to work on these relationships and be selective. Jesus sets the example for us. Jesus had how many disciples? How did he get them? He selected them. He chose them. He didn't say, well, this is who I'm working with, I guess. You see, he didn't, he didn't say, this is my neighborhood, so I guess I got to play with these kids on the block. He was selective about the ones that he chose, and so are we to be selective about the ones that we choose. Just because you go to school with certain people doesn't mean that you have to be friends with everybody that's at that school. Just because you go to a certain church doesn't mean you have to be friends with everybody in that church. Should you work towards that, be kind, be nice? Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that they have to be your bestie. It doesn't mean that you have to build or invest in that relationship. But you do have to be selective. I encourage you to be selective when choosing your friends. Choose who will challenge you to become better, inspire you to rise higher, and motivate you to be all that you can be. Another thing we have to remember when building these friendships is this. Number two, write down, Remember that he will lead you through seasons of change. He will lead you through seasons of change. You are going to face seasons where your friends will change without your permission when you didn't even want it to happen. 
You know, as much as I told you, my friend Dave, Pastor Dave, well, he's not a pastor anymore now, he's Officer Dave, and uh, he's still my friend. I, I, I can see him, not see him for 10 months, and the next time I see him, it's like we pick up where we left off. But his brother Brian, I was friends with him before Dave, and uh, we were really close. And it's not like I, I don't like Brian now, I do. We just hardly ever talk, and we're not as close as we used to be in, in 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Uh, we were just very close. We did everything together and got in all sorts of trouble together and just had a great time. But then he went to the army. And then he went to Bible college. And then he moved out of state. And we just weren't as close. And I remember that was hard for me for a while. There was a season where I was like, a part of me just died. You know what I mean? They moved away and they left. And, and part of me was actually kind of angry. I'm like, what does he think he's doing? Doesn't he know that he exists for me? <laughs> You know, I never said those words, but sometimes that's how we, we react. And it was a season of change. I want, I want to encourage you in this. There's going to be times when seasons will change in friendships. God will navigate you through those if you will allow him to. The season, if it's changing, if you're in the midst of that right now, know this. If it's changing, it doesn't necessarily mean that something's bad. If something could be great. But, but don't get mad. Don't get bitter. Don't get hateful. Start being thankful instead. Thank you, Lord, for that season. Lord, I thank you for the years that I had. I had no other friend like Brian at that time in my life, and I thank you for Brian. I don't get to see him as much now, but I thank you that when I was there at that season and at that age that I had him. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that. See, if you can be thankful for what you had, you can, he can trust you with more because you're going to take it right back to him as a, as, a, as a son to a father and say, thank you, Dad. Thank you for blessing me. See, where are you at right now that you just need to choose to be thankful? I, I know sometimes we get stuck and say, I don't know if there's anything to be thankful for right now. His seasons are changing all the time. Be thankful. Know this, the, the, same, the same God that opens doors is the same God that closes them. Sometimes we see a door close and we think, what did we do wrong? What did they do wrong? Uh, we try to figure things out. Sometimes seasons are just changing. God opens doors, he closes doors. The season may have been a good season, but it's over now. Don't feel guilty, let it go. I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that the reason many people live beneath their potential, their God-given potential, is because they get stuck and they can't let certain things go. I, I don't understand, you know, why they, and we work harder trying to keep them as our friend when just seasons are changing. Proverbs 22 says this, it says, don't make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with uh, one easily angered, or you may learn this way and get yourself ensnared. Uh, you may get trapped. You may get stuck. Did you catch that? It said, do not associate with somebody like that who's hot-tempered, mad, and just goes off the handle. In other words, may, it's your choice. It's my choice. We make that choice. Now, Someone may be here saying, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, because you just described my husband. You just described my wife. You know, and the Bible says, do not be associated, so therefore I can be done with it. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't you go and try to twist the word of God. It'll snap back at you, all right? If you are here today and you have, if I've just described you and, and your family, your son, daughter, mom, dad, you are joined at the hip. You are joined at the hip. You sign the line. Your, your family now gets to become a boot camp where you're going to learn to interact with your spouse, where you're going to learn to uh, work things out with your parents. You're going to learn to love and respect. I ain't going to learn to love and respect. Well, it's, maybe it's going to take some work. Maybe, maybe they need to give you something to love and respect before you can do it. But we have to make sure that we understand, even through the midst of change, that we have to stay with this, work through it, maybe pray, repent, because when you do, God transforms those relationships. And the last thing is this in relationships. Number three, write this down. The next season, here it is, choosing good friends. Don't live below your God-given potential. Let God lead you through seasons of change. But the next season that he's moving you into, choose good friends. Now, you might think that that was a given thing, wouldn't you? You know, why should somebody have to look you in the eye and say, choose good? Why do people have to tell you to choose good? Usually it's because we choose bad. If we didn't choose bad, somebody wouldn't have to say choose good. Deuteronomy, God has to tell the children of Israel. 
He says, I set before you uh, life, not death. I set before you blessings. Choose life. Choose the blessings. They used to bug me. Why does God have to tell them to choose it? Because they kept choosing the wrong thing. Why were they choosing the wrong thing? Because they want what they wanted when they wanted it. Sound like anybody you know? <laughs> we want that, don't we? And so he, sa- I, I, he says, choose good friends. Now, let me discuss this for just a moment. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, chapter 6. I think of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel's the one that was in a lion's den. Daniel was in prison, but yet he served with such a great heart. And it says in Daniel, chapter 6, 3. Let's read this together. You ready? Go. This Daniel was preferred above the president's and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. He was going to give him the whole kit and caboodle, all authority. He was going to be the man. Why? Because of this excellent spirit that was in him. Because of this excellent spirit. Have you ever wondered why Daniel had such an excellent spirit? You've got to remember at the time of this, He had gone into captivity. There were four different kings that went through his life. Each of them honored him highly because of this excellent spirit. And I thought, why why does Daniel have such an excellent spirit? I believe, to some degree, it was because of the influence of his friends. Do you remember his friends? Who were they? Do you remember? Yeah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When you read about them, you know, we all know that story about, you know, they won't bow down to the idol, so they're thrown into the fiery furnace, and they never burned up. Jesus was in there, and and they came out. And and we learned this in Sunday school, the little story, but it's not a story. It's true life. It happened. These people were the friends of Daniel. All four of them came together from Jerusalem into Babylonian captivity. Daniel's friends, you know what they had? They had an inner fortitude that others did not. I believe Daniel was kind of who Daniel was because of these three friends that he hung around with. These friends basically said, we stand for God, no one else. So then King Nebuchadnezzar, of course, said, here's an idol, here's whatever he created. He said, bow down to this. And they said, no, we're not going to bow to that. They said, you're going to die then. And he said, well, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die sometime. So we might as well die for a good reason. I think God's a good reason. And They had this inner depth and strength to them. I believe the integrity and character of Daniel's friends had seeped into his life, forming this excellent spirit. Your friends will influence you more than you will ever realize. Who are you surrounding yourself with? They're going to influence you more than you realize. Let me read this to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 15.33. It's not in your outlines, but if you want to write it down, go ahead. 1 Corinthians 15.33, and it says... Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Think about that. That's pretty simple. I don't think you have to read between too many lines there. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Or some translations say good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. Then, if that's true, then good company will straighten out or clear up bad morals. Good company can help you develop better standards, better principles, and increase your significance. You might ask, well, where do I find these friends? Where do, where do I start? That little letter A, write this down. Don't get friends by default. Don't settle for that. Don't get friends by default. Just because they live down the street doesn't mean you have to play with them, Okay. Select your friends just as Jesus did. He chose 12 to be with him. He didn't end up with them by default. He chose 12, so you and I, we must choose wisely as well. Letter B, where do I start? Start where you are. Start where you are. What what do I mean by that? How about this? Look in the mirror. Start there. I said, well, Pastor Jim, I'm, you know, 72 years old, 65. Do I really need to learn anything? Absolutely. We've got a lot to learn. God's not done with you yet. And if you don't know how to learn to build and establish good relationships, then you're limited in what God can use you for. You see, before you put your notes completely away, is there any room at the bottom of those outlines? Let me give you a little assignment. Are you serious? I got an assignment? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. It's going to be up to you whether you do it or not. Um, But... Before I give that to you, let me, 
But what I want us to do is this. See, we have to be willing to think about what kind of a friend you want. Think about that for a minute. What kind of a friend do you want? What kind of a friend do you want in your life surrounding you with? Because whatever kind of a friend you want, I, I thought about that and I wrote down a few things. Like, well, I want, I want people to have, the people that I call friends, I want them to have a good attitude. If you don't have a good attitude, we're not going to be very good friends. I, I just, that's important to me. I value that. Good attitude. I, I, I value disciplining um, against bad habits. Not because I'm so good at it, but because sometimes I've been so bad at it. I got to make it a discipline. I, 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 want, I want there to be a quality about how much I love my wife and my kids and loving God. I, I want this quality of being stretched by God, but yet being filled by His Spirit. Because that, that's what causes growth. Um, these are the kind of people I want to surround myself with. And when you become that, and you start thinking of those things and writing them down, when you start doing that yourself, when you start looking and aiming at what you want, you must also become that kind of a person. You know what I mean? You've got to start investing in that and make sure that you're, you're investing wisely. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Not partially, but completely. Well, what do you mean by this? Well, the eyes of the Lord are moving to and fro to support, to pull, uh, to gather those hearts that are like his, is what he's doing. That are, he's looking for those that have their sights set on him. If your heart is like God's heart, you won't have to look very hard for God because he will find you, is what it's saying. So when you're talking about friendships and you want people who have a good attitude, then maybe you should try having a good attitude and those that have good attitudes will be easier to spot and easier to find. If you want to work at having friends, well, I want a friend that'll tell me the truth. Well, then start by telling the truth and becoming a truthful person because that truthful character quality will attract truthful people. But if you act like a bonehead, guess who you're going to attract? Boneheads. Right. He says the choice is ours and we need to make a decision on what we're going to do and what qualities we're going to focus on. So here's my challenge to you today. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you about some relationships that you need to prune. Oh, I don't want to prune. That means cut. Cut means hurt. Hurt means pain, and I don't like pain. Sometimes pains are growing pains, though. Sometimes we're, we're moving into a new season. I want you to ask the Lord this week sometime. And I'm going to pray that it just bugs you and you keep thinking about it. Because you just start to ruminate and think. And, Lord, is there any areas, any relationships any friendships, anything that you say I need to get rid of. I need to prune it. Now, I know some of you right now are like, oh, thanks a lot, Pastor. I've been trying to avoid that stupid question because if I ask it, then, then he's going to answer. And if he answers, then I'll have to do something. Yeah, I know. It stinks, doesn't it? But that's part of being responsible. Ask yourself that. I want you to write down, not now, but this week, but remember this, I want you to write down four people that have qualities you would like to become a part of your life. Like I just said, well, I want people that encourage me. Write that down. I want people that, 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 that'll tell me everything good about me. Maybe you're going to say something like that. The only problem with that is, is that means you've got to be the kind of person that's always telling everybody how good they are. And usually we're not, we're not going to do that. What good quality? Well, I want somebody that's going to be truthful. Then write that down. I want somebody that's, that's going to pray for me. And they'll take the initiative to do that. Then write that down. I want you to write those down. And then I want you to start to look for those people. You see, if you write down people, areas, whatever it is, where the, the Lord's saying, get rid of this, and then you write down four people where you're saying, I'd like to start to develop this in my life, I want you to see the difference of, of how one pulls you one way and one pulls you another. You see, whichever one you agree to, that's the direction you're going to go. You have complete control over that. I want you to look at that. And then my challenge will be this. Somehow, some way, make an attempt to get together with those four people. You don't have to do all four at once. You have to get together and say, yeah, I got to do that stupid thing Pastor was talking about. You want to go get a Coke? <laughs> you know, for guys, I know it's different. For guys, maybe we're going to be like, you know what? Hey, you want to you go shoot some guns? You know, we'll just go blow some stuff up. Guys like to blow stuff up. 
I'm very cool with that. I love blowing stuff up. Fire, I love burning, but we got to be careful. There's, you know, limits to this. So, you know, guys like to do some of those guy things. Maybe you want to go get some coffee. Maybe you want to shoot guns. Maybe you want to, I, I don't know what else it might be. Ladies, I know we got a couple shoe stores in town. Believe me, I know. And, oh, did I say that out loud? Uh, just kidding. just like to give my heart, my wife a hard time. Maybe you guys are going to say, hey, let's go shoe shopping. Let's just go, let's just go. we're not going to spend any money. We're just going to window shop. And then, that's not working. Okay. Maybe you're going to go shoe shopping and you're going to say, let's just go to the store. Let's go, go down to b Debs. Let's go over to Steam Anchor and get some coffee. Let's go, you know, you can, you can incorporate coffee. You can incorporate, you, you ladies are better at that. It just naturally comes. That's why statistics show men are the ones that have the fewest friends because we do not want to let ourselves become vulnerable. So guys, I'm really talking to you. I know some of you are listening to me going, that's a great message and I'm going to pass that along to my son or I'm going to tell my dad. Or I'm going to let my friend know. No, I'm speaking to you right now. You write down those four names. Oh, but what am I going to say? I don't want to be like asking a dude out on a date or something like. I didn't say ask him out on a date. I said call him and go shoot something. Drink some coffee. Just don't combine the two. That might be tragic. Why? So you can get intentional about building relationships. When you get intentional about building relationships, God blesses that. He honors that. So make sure you invest your life. Don't waste it. Your horizon will be brighter and you'll find that as you invest in this, you're becoming more like the person you've always wanted to be. You're not just looking for friends now. Guess what? You're becoming one. You're becoming one. So Father, I thank you that as we close that, Lord God, this is not just the end of a message, but Lord, that it's the beginning of a new season in our life. Lord, I pray that you will have just given each and every one of us deposited within our hearts and understanding that relationships are so valuable to you. They're so valuable that you said, I'm going to send my son to die on a cross so that I can be with my sons and daughters forever. That's how much God loves relationships. That's how much he loves you. And then he says, then I want you to build relationships. Why? Well, the greatest commandment is, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is just like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes these are difficult to learn. Sometimes they're hard to develop. But God will honor and will bless those. Maybe you're here today and you've not made that decision for a relationship with Jesus Christ. I just want to give you that opportunity. I don't want to be foolish enough to just ignore this. Maybe you're here today. You've not asked Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've not made that decision. If that's you and you know you need to, just simply raise your hand and look at me. I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out. I'm just going to agree with you in prayer. God sees your hand in your heart. Today as you raise your hand, God fills your heart with a love from above that is unexplainable. And it erases all of those things. He said, I'm not good enough. No, you are good enough because of Christ who lives within you. The Word of God says that. You receive that today. Is there any other hearts here today? You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want that kind of a love. I want, I want to know that I've made my heart right. Well, God, is there any other hearts? I'll wait for just a moment. Okay. I agree with you. God sees your hand in your heart. There's nothing you do, nothing you've done, nothing that can, that can push God away. There is not one thing that makes him look and say, oh, what the heck? He looks at you and says, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to look at the past. If you spend your life trying to move forward by looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to go in the ditch. But he says, get rid of it. He says, yeah, you've got to know, be aware of it, but look out the windshield now because he's got new horizons for you. You just need to be willing to go. Get in that place. It may require you to change your scenery. It may require you to change your environment. It may require you to change your heart. But as you do it, God says, I will give you a brand new spirit. You will be able to do all things through Christ because it's him that will strengthen you. Nothing that you've done, but just his simple and genuine love that he has for you. Walk in that. Just receive that. Think about that this week. Can that really be true? And he's going to start to reveal things to you. And you're going to say, I don't know if that was him or not. It was him. It was him. Don't ignore it. We'll just try that. And see what he speaks to you. Any other hearts here today? Wait for just a moment. I agree with you. God sees your hand and your heart. It's such a great spirit he pours out within you. Do you, know, I, do you know how fearfully and wonderfully you've been made? And do you know how much he is so proud and he loves you? Not that he loves you more than he loves anyone else, but he's got such a love that says, you are so special. There is something about you that nobody else has. 
and I've made you that way. So don't sell yourself short. Don't ever but buy the lie. Know that he has deposited in your heart and in your spirit significance and greatness. And you may not even understand exactly what that means, but I'll guarantee you this, that as you continue to seek first the kingdom of God, you're going to see things explode in your life and you're going to see his favor on your life and you're going to see his hand move within your life and you're going to see yourself passing people by. Don't be discouraged. Those will be seasons that will change. You just keep your eyes focused on him and watch how God will lead you. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means in school, in work, in ministry. What it, it, may, it may be all of them. All I know is, is don't try to figure God out. Just keep your eyes locked on him. And where he goes, you just follow after him, okay? Is there any other hearts here today? You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I, I, I don't want to be forgotten in this. Any other hearts? All right. Father, I thank you for your spirit. I pray today that as we leave here, we not leave just saying, oh, man, we had church. That was pretty cool. Lord, may we leave today knowing that we have seeds in our hearts, words that you've spoken to us. And, Lord, we are asking you to give us that strength in our spirit to know that the enemy cannot take it. We can only give it away. So we're not going to give it away. And Lord, I pray that the enemy would not try to steal this. Lord, that you would seal it with your very spirit, that we'd know that we walk in your word and in your truth. We ask in Jesus' name.